So welcome everyone um, to our very first lecture for 2022. It's, it's exciting to be back. And um, the seventh lecture in our series, the SOAS World Philosophy Lecture Series. Um, last year when we began, we um, focused on the very concept of um, world philosophy the prospects and challenges of talking about philosophy from global. Um, if you're just joining us, could you please uh, mute yourself? So, um, from a global human perspective rather than from a strictly Western perspective. And we've had quite some very interesting talks um, from um, Professor Peter King, um, Amit Dabash, uh, Boaventura de Soa Santos, um, Veli Mitova, uh, Upo Shivase, Peter Park. And we've had very interesting, um, very interesting uh, discourses last year. This year we are doing something uh, a bit, well, not so different, but more specific on uh, uh, talking on specific themes in specific philosophical traditions. And so it's very, um, uh, exciting that we are beginning this year with Mexican philosophy. Uh, before we introduce our guest speaker, Professor Carlos Sanchez, uh, we would like to uh, introduce, I would like to introduce a few of my colleagues. Um, I have here uh, Dr. Sean Hawthorne, who is the uh, convener for the World Philosophies Program here at, Sean, uh, here at SOAS. Sean, uh, can you say hello? And uh... hello, everyone, and and you're um, welcome. It's lovely to see you here, and um, I hope that you will join our mailing list because we do these seminars um, every month, and our great plan is to to make sure that philosophy becomes decolonized. It uh, begins to recognize that the rest of the world um, has intellectual traditions that are worth investigating and thinking with and uh, we really hope that you will join us in this enterprise so thanks for coming today yeah thank you sean and yeah that that really summarizes the whole uh, point of the lecture series uh, as it fits very well into how we see philosophy at source um we we are really striving to ensure that it is as decolonized and as inclusive as possible um, another colleague here is um, Dr. Bion Freter, uh, who is um, uh, part of the World Philosophies team here at SOAS. Uh, would you like to say hello, Bion? Yes, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to be co-host for the first time. The last time I was still a visitor, so I'm very happy to be here today again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bion. Um, so we have um, with us, um, Professor Carlos Sanchez, so I'll say a few words just to introduce him. Um, Carlos Sanchez is a professor of philosophy and director of the graduate program at Nancy State University. Could you mute yourself, please? I think you just joined me. Okay, thank you. He's also chair of the American Philosophical Association Committee on Hispanics and Latin. Um, He's also chair of the Inter-American Relations for the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy, SAF, and executive editor of the Journal of Mexican Philosophy. He is also associate editor of the Journal of World Philosophies and founding member of the Society for Mexican American Philosophy. Uh, Professor Sanchez works primarily on the history of Mexican philosophy, the philosophy of violence, and the philosophy of immigration. He has published a number of articles and books on these issues. And some of his um, uh, publications include um, the book by the State of University of New York Press, uh, Contingency and Commitment, Mexican Existentialism and the Place of Philosophy. Uh, another one is a sense of brutality, philosophy after uh, narco culture. Uh, he is also author of The Suspension of Seriousness, 
on the phenomenology of George Putelia and has um, a manuscript uh, with Bloomsbury Press that is forthcoming, uh, which focuses on core themes in Mexican philosophy. Uh, he is also the editor of the Oxford University Press book, um, Mexican Philosophy in the 20th Century, and Social Readings. So we definitely have um, one of the finest Mexican philosophers in our time uh, with us, and we are eagerly looking for forward to his talk titled on Mexistentialism, existentialism with the M, so on Mexistentialism. So um, Professor Sanchez, Carlos, you have uh, our full attention. All right. Thank you everybody for, for coming. I'm gonna share my screen here and see if I can entertain you with a PowerPoint presentation. All right, so that's my screen. I hope you can see it. Yeah, we can see that. Um, okay, so that's the title of my talk is on existentialism. Uh, and I'm going to do a little bit of reading and a little bit of uh, just talking as I go. Um, please feel free to stop me if, you, there's, if there's any questions or any, anything that needs uh, clarification on the spot and I, and I, I can get back to it. Um, so I'll begin uh, with this quote from uh, the Mexican philosopher Jorge Portilla, who says that we Mexicans are existentialists by birth. Um, I try to make sense of that in this talk. So uh, existentialism is uh, short for Mexican existentialism or existentialism a la Mexicana. Like traditional existentialism, it takes seriously the concreteness or facticity of human existence its situatedness, its finiteness, and its various limitations. Unlike traditional or European existentialism, existentialism locates the human struggle in a determinate space-time, one which affects our being human in a definite way, always depending on where and when one happens to find oneself. For Mex existentialism, the determinate space-time is Mexico, and in particular, uh, particularly uh, post-colonial and post-revolutionary Mexico. This Mexico is a historical accident of Europe that for half a millennium has struggled to find itself or to find its identity. Uh, the Mexican subject, El Mexicano, reflects this accidentality and this struggle, contending with Nepantla and Sosobra as a way of life, Lo Mexicano. Mexistentialism thus takes seriously its Mexicanness as fundamental to the human struggle, a struggle which, which it recognizes only in its Mexican and not in its abstract or universal expression. In other words, human existence is Mexican existence, but not because of some arrogant relative, relativism that says that all there is is Mexican existence, but because existence becomes significant or meaningful only to the one who lives it, which for Mexicans is their own Mexican existence or that which is nearer to their concerns. Elsewhere, I have referred to this Mexican version of existentialism as existentialism with parentheses on the end so as to highlight its otherness to European existential traditions. That parenthesis, however, indicates a marginalization, suppression, or silencing of the Mexican contribution to existentialism understood globally. At this time, I remove the parentheses and signal the end of, the end of Mexican existentialism's parenthetical ex existence. Um, now, a little bit of background or history. Uh, Mex uh, Mex existentialism uh, comes to Mexico uh, in the mid to late 1940s. I mean, I'm sorry, in the late 1930s, um, and via the uh, the work of the Spanish uh, exiles, uh, refugees from the Spanish Civil War, uh, also known as transterrados. Uh, among these is uh, the the, uh, the Spanish philosopher Jose Gauss. Uh, Gauss uh, was a student of Ortega y Gasset. Uh, and a, also a student of Martin Heidegger. Uh, so he brings uh, these traditions with him to Mexico City where he begins in the late 1930s uh, to offer courses on existentialism and specifically on Martin Heidegger. Uh, in 1940, he begins the translation of uh, Being in Time, uh, which he is the first to translate uh, fully by 1951 uh, into a language other than German. Uh, and uh, during that time, during the 1940s, he offers a series of courses uh, on what he's working on and being in time. 
uh, influencing an entire generation of philosophers and process. Uh, of course, his, ex, his reading of Heidegger and his reading of, uh, of Sartre and Merleau Ponty uh, is going to be very influenced by his own background as a Ortega scholar. Um, now Ortega is, uh, is known to be, to advocate for something that I refer to as circumstantialism. Uh, the idea that uh, what matters is the circumstance uh, and that the world is seen through the circumstance, this sort of perspectivism. Uh, and so by, by the late night, by the mid 1940s, uh, existentialism is firmly rooted in Mexico um, and young intellectuals are starting to grasp onto this uh, and to try to look at Mexican reality to, through that lens, um, finding new ways to talk about their own experience in this, in this way. Uh, there's a, a shift that happens in the mid 1940s um, where Gauss's influence begins to become a bit too oppressive, uh, right? This, this idea that uh, Heidegger um, is, uh, is the end all be all of uh, existentialism is challenged by these uh, young Mexican upstarts um, who see in the technical rigor of Heidegger's philosophy a sort of, uh, I call it a colonial prejudice, right? To, to do philosophy in a certain way. Uh, and, um, and from this, uh, they decide that uh, they're going to look at Sartre and Morel Ponty and the French existentialists a little bit closer to see if they can give, if, if from that they can get a, a, better, a better picture of things. Uh, and so that's what they do towards the, towards the late 1940s uh, is that they uh, started looking at French existentialism and move away from uh, uh, technical philosophy of Martin Heidegger. Uh, in the process, they, they gain this, uh, this sense of uh, this ethical stance that was missing in Heidegger and that was notoriously missing in being in time. Uh, and and the, the, the ethical stance is offered by Sartre and Mario Ponty's work. Uh, and, so, and so that's that's the history. I have a few pages of that that I'm not going to, that I'm not going to read, but uh, that's basically the background of, of how existentialism is uh, planted in Mexico uh, City during this time. And we can talk about that more. Uh, afterwards. Um, so, so these are some of the faces, uh, a bunch of men, mostly white men. <laughs> um, now, <clears throat> my, my secret aim uh, is to insert existentialism into the standard history of existentialism, disorienting that history and unsettling our efforts to tell it as we have been telling it. Thus far, I've only given, uh, I have not given much of a reason to suspect that existentialism is disorienting in this way, uh, or that it contributes anything uh, significantly new or unique to the standard existentialist narrative. As we will now see, while existentialism appropriates and traffics in the standard notions of European existentialism, as it should, it enriches the ex existing conceptual archive with notions that, because they are derived from the Mexican experience, should unsettle our efforts to tell that standard story as we have been telling it. We are familiar, of course, with the conceptual horizon of European existentialism, one in which we find the notions of freedom, thrownness, anxiety, responsibility, death, subjectivity, faith, absurdity, and boredom. To these, existentialism adds accidentality, insufficiency, sosobra, nepantla, uh, humanism, response, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, nepantla, yeah, that's, those are the ones it adds while remaining, uh, while reimagining concepts such as freedom, responsibility, and death and humanism. So let's, uh, I'm gonna briefly try to go over these. And the first is accidentality. So accidentality refers to the being of S when S is understood as contingent, indeterminate, reliant, conditional, non-necessary, insufficient, unsubstantial, or dependent on P. History reveals Mexico as accidental to Europe, to the Spanish colonial project. Its people as contingent byproducts of colonization. Its culture as reliant on European culture and the mestizo ways of life, Mexican being, as always already insufficient in relation to European and indigenous ways of life. In everyday life, Mexicans, either by corazonada or explicitly, know this and live with the knowledge of their accidental introduction into world history. However, a central decolonizing claim of Uranga's philosophy 
is uh, Emilio Ranga's philosophy, is that being accidental is not a deficient mode, but rather that deficiency is the authentic or actual situation of human uh, being human. Uranga concludes, in fact, that to be human is to be always insufficient, always dependent, always unnecessary, always accidental. Uranga says that to be human is to be a minus of being. Moreover, and I have that quote here, the accident is fragility, he says, oscillation between being and nothingness. This means that it's fit in being, it's adhesion to being expressed in the modality of being in, is not protected by an inalienable right, but rather whatever may be the form of its inheritance. It is always revocable. The accident is constantly threatened by displacement. Attached to being, it can always be torn off from its there, exterminated. Whatever it holds onto, whatever handle it grabs onto can be removed. It was born to be in and at the same time to not be in. The insecurity of being is manifested in the view that reality seems to be constantly slipping away in the knowledge that everything is revocable and unhinged and that the world itself is threatening and overwhelming. But more specifically, this lack of permanence points to fragility and vulnerability that describes us all. This book by Emilio Oranga was written in 1952, um, and it summarizes this existentialist position uh, of Mexican philosophy. Um, the, next, uh, the next concept is insufficiency. And I couldn't, I couldn't find an image for this uh, other than <laughs> like this, these cartoons. So I, I just left a bunch of text there. Um, to be accidental is also to be insufficient. Insufficiency is a relational term pointing to how one exists in relation to both the idea of perfection or substance and to others who represent these. However, insufficiency is not inferiority. While inferiority has been attributed to Mexicans, specifically by the Mexican philosopher Samuel Ramos in 1934 uh, in his profile of man and culture in Mexico, it pretends to explain the psychology of those who feel less than others. That's inferiority. Uranga proposes against this uh, view of inferiority by, that the Ramos puts forth, that we talk instead of insufficiency, which refers less to an individual or cultural neurosis and more to an actual ontological relations before an idea, one represented by the image of the European colonizer or Mexican, as well as to the ontological fact of being accidental. Uranga writes, insufficiency, ontologically speaking, characterizes what is accident in relation to substance. Every modality of being grounded on accident is partially grounded on an absence. These modes of being are situated in inconsistent and fractured base, unquote. What this means is that as accident, the Mexican is insufficient to substance. To be insufficient to substance is to be always in a state of lack, of wanting. It is to exist as if one's very identity is grounded metaphysically, psychologically, and ontologically on an incompletion, an unfulfillment, an absence of substance. This is an original state revealed to the Mexican by historical fact, the trauma of conquest, the violence of colonialism, and the uncertainty and insecurity of independence have made insufficiency palpable. In this way, the being that constitutes Mexican being is a reduced being a negative being or a minus of being. Insufficient or negative or quote, negatively conceived, the accident is a privation, an absence, a penury, a lack or defect of substance, an insufficient being, unquote. And now the fact that my inferiority shows up when I compare myself to others and find myself coming up short or unable to measure up points to this more profound insufficiency or lack of being. Inferiority is an expression of my insufficiency. However, the profundity of insufficiency points to it being a more general condition of existence, one affecting both myself and the other with whom I compare myself equally. We are both insufficient and lack being in relation to the idea of perfection or substance. Ultimately, the recognition of insufficiency is empowering. Mexicans arrive at the truth of being human, and in the recognized insufficiency are closer than the European others to the truth, to that truth, because Mexicans know their existence to be fragile, always revocable, and always threatened by displacement. That is, they know their existence to be accidental. The truth, if we may speak of truths here, 
is that accidentality and insufficiency is all there is. In short, insufficiency describes a mode of being of the human as an always already incomplete project, a project becoming or a becoming project. Now in the Pantla, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm not gonna elaborate too much on, on this concept here I'll, uh, because uh, I've, I've done it elsewhere and, um, and I've also, and this is this, this, this uh, expert here, excerpt here is part of a larger project where I spent an entire par an entire chapter talking about this, but um, what we will uh, what, what I'll say is that uh, within the project of existentialism, Nepantla describes the in betweenness of being, a being in between being, not a being in between being and non being, as as is suggested by 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 Nepantla himself by Uranga himself. Um, as it would, as this would mean simply existence as being towards death. If, if you have if you have a being in between being and non-being, that's what it suggests to me. Rather, what we're talking about is an in-betweenness that is that uncomfortable middlehood that is that is neither ground nor foundation, but a space of convergence and divergence, of suspension and pendularity, to which being returns as it swings to and fro, different possible modes available to itself given its determinate particular circumstance. In every sense then, Mexican identity is thought to be dynamic rather than static, a constant migration from coasts to valleys, from edges to centers and peripheries to peripheries without the possibility of settling in any one of these. Nepantla designates a middlehood that describes people whose identity is fluid, migratory and undefined. Given its complexity and his role in defining Mexican being or the being of Mexican being, Uranga called Nepantla the cardinal category of our ontology. So this is an important concept. Uh, so Sobra, which uh, I try to disentangle from Nepantla, uh, and I've been trying to do this for a while and uh, I don't know if I am succeeding, but I'm trying to pay it like, tear these two terms apart and make them two different things. Um, so you, you have Nepantla, which is this in-betweenness of being. Uh, and, and the idea is that uh, as products of colonization, products of conquest, the Mexican mestizo, the hybrid identity of the Mexican uh, is always in between these two world conceptions of the European and the indigenous. And, and that nothing's going to settle this issue. They're always going to be in between. Uh, now, Sosobra uh, is, is a different concept to me. While Nepantla is a fundamental ontological category describing the nature of a Mexican existence in general as an in-betweenness, Sosobra, I, I call it an ontic or existential category describing the way in which the Mexican actually experiences that being in between. Uh, Sosobra is the affective manifestation or the feeling of being Nepantla. So Sobra names the anxiety of not knowing where one stands at any one time, the feeling of sinking and drowning that overtakes one in moments of desperation or in times of catastrophe, or the feeling of being pulled on all sides by conflicting demands. And so Sobra one struggles to hold on to the meaning or to find what to meaning or to find one's way given the available possibilities of existence. Uranga imagines this as a mode of being that incessantly oscillates between two possibilities between two affects without knowing on which one of these to depend, on which of these to cling to for justification. That was his, his quote. I imagine it as a, be, as a feeling of being quartered by uncertainties, as if by horses. And that's, that, that's, that's why I have this image up here. That's what I imagine the Sobra to be. Uh, it's, it's being pulled on all sides right, by, by conflicting uh, demands. This is Sosobra, and Uranga thinks it manifests the Nepantla nature of Mexican identity, as I understand it. As such, Sosobra never gives us a, quote, fixed and solid ground, but, pre repre but presents the world underfoot as quicksand as on which nothing firm can stand. It's uncertainty. Luis Villoro, another Mexican existentialist philosopher, adds that Sosobra characterizes our being as accident, reflected in our constant pursuit of security, permanence, or substance. He writes, quote, the privileged sense of Sosobra reveals the accidentality of being itself and of the world. This one appears as insubstantial and fragile. 
with us try to flee from our own insubstantiality by seeking substance. So it's a constant trying to fulfill something. Now as to the concepts that, uh, that we are familiar with, uh, the first is freedom. Mexican existentialism does not promote the notion of absolute freedom famously proposed in Sartre's being a, being a nothing. As it does not seem to cohere with the picture of the world belonging to a post-Western, post-colonial national community like Mexico. Certainly a history of colonial subjugation and imperial intervention instilled in Mexican consciousness an unambiguous desire for freedom. However, the desire of freedom is not absolute, but qualified and takes the form of a positive freedom to commit or not commit oneself or to be responsible for one's circumstance. Uh, hence, in his confrontation with Sartre, Leopoldo Zea, another one of these famous uh, important Mexican existentialists, attends not to the absolute freedom of Sartre's early existentialism, but to Sartre's mature version in the critique of dialectical reason, for instance. Um, and he calls it, he calls freedom situated and committed. Freedom is situated and committed. It will be irresponsible, according to Zer, to quote, maintain the idea of freedom in a full and absolute sense when the whole of humanity is in crisis. What is needed, he says, echoing the later Chartre, is quote, a responsible freedom, one aware of its limits, one of limits, one always aware. Zea thus endorses a view of freedom where the restriction imposed takes the form of commitment or responsibility. In this way, freedom and responsibility are two sides of the same coin, or as Zea puts it, quote, where there is no responsibility, there is no freedom. Luis Villoro, uh, his, his notion of freedom is articulated in more traditional phenomenological terms. He proposes that angst and vertigo or being before the, the abyss into which I could, I could fall at any moment reveals me in my freedom because at any moment I can throw myself into that abyss willingly. On Villoro's, on Villoro's reading, absolute freedom is actually impossible because in my being free, I find myself always already in a context of significance. One that quote, reveals a tightly woven fabric of phenomena that imprisons me, unquote. The notion that there is a prison of phenomena in which I find myself refers to the fact that those things that stand around me, what Ortega y Gasset called the circumstance, mesmerize me. They hold me in my attention and thus limit or restrict my physical and psychical movements. This is an unavoidable, unav unavoidable imprisonment since one is always in the world and thus cannot, cannot not be involved in and with things. This might be seen as a loss of freedom, but for Villoro, it is the only kind of freedom we have. True freedom is only possible in the encounter with the other. In appearing before me, the other reveals her freedom and her ability to escape my conceptualization and revealing and in revealing her freedom. I find that her freedom is made possible through me or because of me or in spite of me. More importantly, I become aware at that moment that I am willing to lose my freedom in the dialectic with the other as her quote, faith, her faith becomes mine, unquote. As with Zea, freedom for Bioro is subordinated to responsibility, responsibility for another who escapes my grasp, yet whose faith is tied to mine, which brings me to responsibility. <clears throat> Zea summarizes an existentialist view of freedom like this, he says, our freedom is expressed in the form in which we assume the inevitable commitment to our circumstance, unquote. This inevitable commitment is assumed because the faith of the other, the other person, the circumstance, the, or even the absolute is tied with mine. What happens to my circumstance happens to me or vice versa. Ortega famously puts this in 1914 in his meditation San Quixote, he says, if I do not save my circumstance, I do not save myself. I am thus responsibly committed to caring for that which is proximal to me and to, and to my concerns. Zea elaborates on this, quote, for what situation must we be responsible? What commitments must our philosophy responsibly make? After all, if we are to be faithful to our philosophizing, we have to affirm that our situation is not that of John Sartre. Our situation is not that of the European bourgeoisie. Before making ourselves responsible for the world's commitments, 
we must be responsible for our own concrete situation. We must be conscious of our situation to make ourselves responsible for it." Unquote. In this passage, we find the clue to the existentialist difference. The M in existentialism refers to the notion that our situation is not that of, is not that of John Paul Sartre. Our situation is Mexican. In fact, my situation, mine, Carlos Sanchez, my situation is not that of either John Paul Sartre or Zeph. My situation is wholly mine and, I'm, I, and I must be conscious of it and take responsibility for it before I make my commitments to abstract entities like world or humanity. Of course, this does not mean that existentialism advocates the type of narcissism that would prohibit caring, caring for the world or for humanity. But that world and that humanity, humanity must be concrete and not abstract. And I may, care for, I may care for it after I care for those who I love, for my community, for my nation, et cetera. Um, I teach a lot of business ethics uh, courses and ethics of care comes to mind here. As accidental and insufficient, I can only care so much. The task for existentialism is ultimately to, to shepherd us to a recognition of our own responsibilities and commitments, which will be unique to us as our circumstance, habitat, or world is unique to us. But this means facing accidentality, so sobra and epantla and the burden of our particular histories. This follows from Zea, who claims that, quote, existentialism does not wish to elude reality, does not evade it, it confronts it, assuming it with all of its consequences, unquote. Now I include this, uh, this notion of humanism in here, um, because I think it really kind of separates or, or highlights what, what I'm trying to, to say here about existentialism with an M. Uh, accidentality, insufficiency, Nepantla, and Sosobora appear as defining characteristics of persons who live in Mexican existence, where Mexican is understood as a horizon of possible experience. But it's also defining a defining characteristic of human being as such, that is, of what it means to be human due mainly to the testimony of history, one that carries with it a familiarity with these existential and ontological realities, Mexicans are quick to identify them as their defining characteristics, even if pre-theoretically in ordinary non-philosophical language. However, this does not mean that these, that, these definition, that these definitions define only Mexicans. For this reason, uh, Uranga makes a rather suggestive proposal the genuine humanity is genuine only when it resembles that which is, in a sense, an experience Mexican. He says, quote, it appears to, a, to us that considering the Mexican person in his being or in his ontological aspect serves or functions as a source for a sense of the human applicable to anything that pretends to represent itself as human. It is not about articulating lo mexicano, that which particularizes us as human, but the opposite. It is about articulating the human in terms of lo mexicano. Lo mexicano is a point of reference for the human. Whatever resembles lo mexicano calibrates itself as human, unquote. The call here is for understanding, for an understanding of the human that reflects those things about the Mexican which philosophically define it, namely accident, insufficiency, sobra, nepantla, et cetera. But we must understand this in its proper light. As this call is not, for instance, that French or Canadians to suddenly seek to mimic Mexican being so as to be properly human. Such imitation will be inauthentic and in, in an act of bad faith. This, this, this call is for Mexicans themselves to recognize their own being as authentic and own up to it as Mexicans, to look nowhere else but to their own reality for that which is truly human, to accept it and to live in accordance with that picture. Elsewhere in Notes on an Ontology of Mexican Being from 1951, Uranga writes, quote, a call for the being of the Mexican does not serve any other purpose than to remind the Mexican person that in her style of life, she has the norm of the human, that if she puts on a mask, she runs the risk of dehumanizing herself. In this general sense, existentialism demands that the standard of humanity we set for ourselves should not be abstract or foreign to ourselves, but reflective of our own concrete and familiar experiences, and we can talk more about that. Now, death. Uh, in existentialism, the relationship to death is one of coexistence, if not, not a possibility. 
In The Labyrinth of Solitude, a very famous book by Octavio Paz, he writes, there are two attitudes towards death, one pointing forward that conceives of it as creation, the other point, pointing backward that expresses itself as a fascination with nothingness or as a nostalgia for limbo. Paz goes on to say that the attitude that points forward is found amongst the peoples of Europe and North America. The backward pointing attitude is found in the peoples of Mexico. We may call the forward pointing attitude the instrumental attitude and the backward pointing attitude may be referred to something like a historical attitude. Now to say that one's attitude towards death is instrumental is to say that death, my death and death in general is something that is yet to come. It is an event in the future. How it's on the horizon and now it's a possibility. The historical attitude on the other hand is one which holds that death is a presence or a perpetual recovery of a past, of a past annihilation. It's, it's something like a coexistence. The instrumental attitude is neatly, neatly described by Sigmund Freud when he says, the goal of all life is death. This means that life is a steady progress towards death. As a goal or a destination, death motivates life forward. Even Heidegger would say that, life, that we are beings towards death, right? always towards that inevitable future. Life's movement, life's movement onward toward death is echoed by the cultural anthropologist Ernest Becker in, the, in his famous book, The Denial of Death. He says, the idea of death, the fear of it, haunts the human animal like nothing else. It is a mainstream of human activity, activity designed largely to avoid the fatality of death, to overcome it by denying in some way that it is the final destiny of man, unquote. This instrumental view of death is a Western or North American attitude. The second historical attitude is summarized by Uranga when he writes, quote, death is the only thing that, Mexican, that the Mexican does not leave for tomorrow. In other words, our being is not a being towards death, but a being with death, an experience in the now and not in the future. Mexicans coexist with death. This means that to coexist with death is much different than simply being aware of its inevitability. For Paz, as with Heidegger, Death as a presence makes possible the very intelligibility of life. Pa says, death defines life. Our death illuminates our life. If our deaths lack meaning, our lives also lack it. Uranga, on the other hand, does not think death to be meaning bestowing. He says this, death is not fear for the ends it brings, nor because it impedes some mission, <clears throat> which, uh, I'm sorry, hold on. Uh, which doesn't exist, nor is it fear for ripping away a self that also does not exist. This is opposed to the extreme case, the German, which is Heidegger's, in which death is imagined as conferring upon life, both individuality and totality. For the Spaniard and for the North American, death takes away something. Well, for German, for the German, it gives. But for the Mexican, it neither gives nor takes because there's nothing to take and there's nothing to give, unquote. The only presence of death is ordinariness and ubiquitousness, means that it has no special significance. It is not romanticized in existentialism as, in, as it is in European existentialism. This is, death is just there in the circumstance as an unglamorous a coexistence. And so I put this picture here by the famous uh, Mexican uh, artist, uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada, which represents this kind of coexistence with, with death. <clears throat> okay, now, Can I be a existentialist? Can I? I'm sorry, I misspelled that. Can I be a existentialism? No, you cannot be an existentialism. Um, it's supposed to say, can I be a existentialist? Mexican philosophers approach existentialism not as a philosophical fad, a charge that some have leveled against post-war French existentialism, or even as a rigorous philosophical method, but as a possibility for a critical philosophical articulation of their own situated reality implying also the possibility for a more responsible engagement with the history, culture, and the future of that reality. Existentialism understood in this context allows the articulation of a mode of existence belonging to historically marginal peoples, those who are accidental as a matter of ontological fact. Moreover, existentialism makes possible the confrontation with ontological aspects of the human being as these are given in Sosobra and Epantla. 
modes of being that reveal indeterminateness and ungroundedness as structuring categories of human life. Here I have tried to offer a profile of what I call existentialism. Not only does existentialism mark the emergence of a philosophical program preoccupied by cultural and historical identity and authenticity, but insofar as it insists on the relevance of cultural or national identity and philosophy, it presents a challenge to Western philosophical hegemony. While European existentialism paints a picture of radical individuality as thrown absolutely free, mired in anxiety and projected towards and now known to come, existentialism conceives of a human person as always already engaged in circumstantial reality. For existentialists such as Villoro, Zea, and Uranga, to exist is to commune, to care, and to engage. Accidentality and insufficiency, Nepantla and Sosobra, while characteristic of our mode of being, do not exempt us from the responsibility to others. On the contrary, insufficiency and accidentality, by pointing to the fragility and finitude of human existence, Call, us to, call on us to live fuller, more caring, more generous lives. That is consciousness of our insufficiency and accidentality, call on us to take responsibility for the other by articulating on her behalf, the urgency to, to, to pursue a genuine and authentic existence and the necessity to forgo the impossible assimilation to purity and perfection. This is a moral orientation we find in feminist existentialism, which is an entire section that I left out of today's talk, but we can discuss that if you want to, as well as, as in existentialism more generally. In other words, the move that follows a deep dive into our own being is a move upward. Bioro explains that one must, quote, get out of insular consciousness so as to arrive at community consciousness because community is a form of life which is superior and it consists only in a personal life praxis which is interpersonal and ethically motivated." Unquote. But Mexican existentialism is also more than Mexican or for Mexico. For example, it goes beyond itself, beyond its space-time limitations, and lends itself to today, as European existentialism did for the Mexican philosophers in the mid 20th century. We can talk then about um, how it affects us, the Latino population in the United States, for example. Like the Mexican experience, ours, like for instance, against that Latinx experience, is one involving marginalization, accidentality, so sobra and epantla, which makes a search for a critical philosophical articulation of our contemporary reality and urgent matter. We feel a kinship with existentialism for many reasons, uh, specifically us Latinos, one of which is historical, another geographical, and still another political. The significance of recognizing this kinship is existential itself. As it, ju it justifies itself, it justifies our philosophy, our voice, our confidence in joining and contributing to a conversation that surely concerns us as human beings. It is in this sense, an alternative vision of the human condition, one that is not Eurocentric. But most importantly, it also lends us concepts that apply directly to us and which do not seem alien, but familiar and known via historical familial relations, for example. With these concepts, we can begin an analysis of our own situated condition. We can reframe our identities as accidental, for instance, and from this refuse the hegemony of the Western intellectual tradition as we endeavor to forge our own. My hope is that we may come to talk about uh, of Mexican existentialism alongside French and German existentialism, or even something that I've heard called American existentialism. Existentialism, like its French or German varieties, is rooted in the notion that human existence is a never ending project, a precarious and uncertain becoming and overcoming. The existentialist urge in Mexico emerges from the suspicion that the Western philosophical inheritance is biased and even arrogant. That, it, that is, the suspicion that philosophical universality and generality are historical constructs serving the interest of European colonial power. That's what Anga says in 52. We are not certain of the existence of man in general or of what passes itself uh, uh, off as man in general, namely generalized European humanity. So the movement away from this doubtful man in general requires a return to origins, that is to the lived world of the non-European, where the generalizations of Western Eurocentric philosophy may not always fit. After all is said and done, the real practical question becomes, can I or you be existentialist? 
If my picture of the world involves the notion that my existence is accidental and that no existence is substantial or absolutely self-sufficient, that my being is a being in a pantla or always in between and always in transition, that while Sosobra defines my everyday life, I can build projects on that basis, that my freedom is qualified and that my freest action would be to commit myself to the needs of my immediate circumstance, but also that I am determined by culture only to the extent that I allow it. And finally, if my picture of the world includes the view that death is not something to look forward to or fear, but an accomplished fact, an event with which I coexist, then yes, I and you can be existentialists. As an existentialist, then, I do not behave carelessly or distant towards myself or my world, for instance, as the protagonist of Camus' Stranger. On the contrary, my behavior, my behavior is caring and involved a manifestation of understanding life's instability and finitude. Ultimately, existentialism is, is but one way to talk about what makes our, world, our, our own individual life both unique, genuine, and worth its philosophical articulation. Thus, we can even talk of Latin existentialists and so on. I saw a couple of the folks here in the audience will chuckle at that. The existentialist position here is not merely a position or a stance, but a description of a form of life which is always already being lived. It thus affirms for us all, Mexican, Latinos, and other peoples historically relegated to the peripheries and margins of philosophy, that we are, and as a matter of fact, or genuinely or authentically, always already grappling with human existence. But perhaps existentialism's most valuable lesson is that in the revelatory articulations of existence as accidental, so sobrante and committed, one is able to communicate a human presence that in its difference affirms the belonging to a global community. I thus invoke existentialism here as a concept that captures a reading of existence through a situated post-Western perspective. Finally, it shows, the, it shows the existential and historical priority of community over subjectivity, implying an ethics of responsibility and commitment to one's particular community and to each other. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Carlos. That was really excellent um, and very, very interesting. Very, very interesting talk. Um, I mean, that it's, um, it's loaded with um, quite a number of um, authentic, um, existentialist concept, if I would say, um, accidentalism, insufficiency, um, the patla, yeah, zozobra, and relational freedom, historical death. Um, and it's interesting that these, these concepts are concepts that can easily be appropriated to non-Western philosophical spaces, just, just as you were saying uh, before you concluded. Um, uh, African philosophy, Eastern philosophy, Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, uh, perhaps due to quite similar concrete lived experiences um, in these in these spaces. Um, I'm sure uh, Sean and beyond smiled when you said the periphery of margins of philosophy because they do they do teach a, a module titled margins of philosophy uh, here at SOAS, uh, the World Philosophies Program, and so there's a lot of concepts um, loaded in your paper that we can really, um, uh, you know, relate with. Um, uh, I'm sure quite a number of us will have um, some questions for you. Um, uh, Dr. B and Fred, I will now take us through the uh, discussion and comment session. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to ask anyone who would like to ask a question, just raise your hand or alternatively, if you prefer that, um, feel free to write it into the chat and I will try to keep up of the order. Ah, wonderful, here we go. Just let me make a note quickly. Yes, Peter, please feel free to ask your question. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I want to say uh, a big, big appreciation to the team at SOAS, uh, Elvis, uh, Leon, and uh, Hatton, and others. Uh, this series has been very, very educative for people like me. Uh, yeah, quickly to my question. Uh, 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 let me say okay, a big thank you to uh, Professor Sanchez. Uh, so, 
while you were uh, been presenting existentialism, I was quite um, very, very interested in your thought. But uh, it, it just struck me that uh, much of the analysis, I mean, the historical analysis you did, uh, seem to uh, take off from uh, the colonial experience of the Mexican people. Now, I was just wondering um, what you would say in terms of um, existentialism uh, pre the arrival of um, the Spanish. I mean, does existentialism also look at uh, the existentialist realities, the realities around the lived world of the Mexicans before uh, the arrival of the Spanish? I mean, the whole colonial experience. Uh, so, so that's my first. That's my question. And if the first question, and if uh, it does that, um, what then would be um, the, the outcome of the interaction of well, these two lived experience, you know, pre. Um, uh, colonial experience pre the Spanish arrival, and then uh, um, the experience during and after the colonial. Uh, so, so that's my. I hope I was quite clear. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, yeah. So, would, would you uh, like to collect questions, or would you like to answer them immediately? Uh, I'll answer them immediately. I, I don't, I'll All forget. Right. So <laughs> I'll just answer them now. Um, I mean, the, the, the simple answer to, to the question is that no, it does not account for a pre-colonial uh, experiences. Um, now, why would that be? Well, because the reason why existentialism uh, finds a crisis in existence is because of that disconnect, right? There, there is a disconnect between um, the pre-colonial uh, world uh, and the colonial world that they're trying to, that, that it causes quite a bit of sosobra, right? Um, it's, it's this idea that um, there, there has, something has been lost, right? A world has been lost, which was a world that was meaning bestowing in many ways. So, so it's, there's a sense in which something big has been, has been lost by an act of violence and conquest or something like that. So um, one of the reasons why Nepantla, why I say that Nepantla defines uh, Mexican existence is because um, Mexicans find themselves in between these two worlds that they really don't have any access to. One world is the indigenous world that is rich and complex and historical. Um, and the other world is the world of the Europeans who have basically abandoned them in a way, right? Historically, um, colonized through colonization and conquest and all of that, they have also been subject to their violence. So they, they find themselves in between these two pillars, these two monoliths of history. And that's where they sit, that's where they are in this Nepantla state, in this middle hood, right? Um, and so, so the, 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 the quick answer to that is, is no, it does not account for that, for that history. Thank you very much. Uh, Manuel, please. Hi, hey, Carlos, thanks so much for the talk. Um, so uh, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a handful of questions and, and feel free to ignore uh, as you like, or you know, it's a choose your own adventure kind of question set. Um, so uh, one question uh, about Uranga and the recommendation. So it, in this talk, it sounds like you were reading Uranga as offering a kind of, or Mexican, Mexican existentialism more generally is offering a kind of normative picture, a recommendation of care, both for the self and about relations to other people. And I'm curious about where you think the story in the picture. Um, so, and again, this is an old, in some sense, an old and familiar question, but one way of putting it is that it looks like accent, that the picture of 
Uranga's accidentality as being in contrast to an indigenous and European substantiality it entails that um, indigenous peoples who are fully embedded in their uh, their world historical views and haven't been assimilated by the project of the kind of post-revolutionary Mexican national state look like they're not Mexican on this account. And it looks like it, you know, and, and this is, of course, you know, there's this ugly history of the, the on the need to Mexicanize the indigenous peoples to pull them into the project of the, of the nation state. And it look, so one way of reading the Uranga on this is, you know, how isn't this just a, a doubling down on the, no, and in fact, these folks aren't, uh, these folks aren't Mexican and that we should make them Mexican. We should want them to be Mexican in as much as the Mexican gets valorized as, as distinctively human. It looks like in some sense, it reproduces some of the dialectic of the of colonization, um, where there's a kind of there's the humans and then there are the indigenous and and the indigenous in some ways are kind of masked or degenerate versions of, of humanity. Um, last is if you want to say something about it, I would love to hear more about the the feminist strand of existentialism. All right, well that's three three choose your own adventure paths. <laughs> Let's see which one I which one I take. Um, uh, first, about the, the this this normative picture uh, business that I'm trying to to pry out of Uranga. Um, well, basically, I th my 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 reading of this is that towards the end of of analysis of Mexican being, uh, which is uh, Uranga's famous uh, book. Uh, published in 52 and uh, which I just recently translated and published this, this year. So there's, there's a plug. Um, he, uh, towards the end of it, uh, he's, when he's talking about Sosobra, um, he seems to be very concerned about the, the idea that, um, he seems to be concerned for community, basically. He's concerned that, that that there, there's uh, this condition of being Mexican in which everybody's fallen into this condition of sosobra, of this uncertainty and anxiety of being torn to shreds. Um, and this common feeling of, of sosobra uh, motivates this call out, this, this idea that, okay, now that we're all suffering this, let's all get together and talk about it and communicate with each other based on this, uh, on this condition. Of, of Sosobra. Uh, and, and to me, that concern with calling out other, with calling out from Sosobra to others uh, is the point at which Uranga commits himself to this um, care for the community. Because if Mexicans, if, if Mexican being is defined by Sosobra, then that means that it's just not him, right? It's an entire community uh, struggling with the same thing. And he wants us to speak from that struggle to each other and with each other. Uh, and that's where I get this idea that, okay, now let's read it back to the accidentality bit. Um, what is he saying about uh, the, 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 the state of Mexican uh, community? Well, he's saying that if, uh, if, we, if we feel that, that, our lives is, that our life is contingent and accidental uh, at the point of fracture at all times, um, that yeah, we will fall into some sort of uh, ex existential vertigo, like like the characters in Camus and The Stranger, or Waiting for Godot, or whatever, right? Like this idea that okay, we're kind of stuck here, uh, paralyzed by this idea that we are accidental. Um, and I think that's something that that Uranga notices at the end of his book, right? Or that's something that he is aware of, and he wants to say, okay, well, no, we don't have to be stuck in this and uh, or paralyzed by our fear of being accidental. Like we can actually call for, call to each other from that, from that accidentality. We can reach out from the accidentality to others. It offers us a common point of the commonality, right? um, something that we can share, communicate with one another. So I don't know if that's gonna be satisfactory to you, uh, but, but that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from with this. Um, now, the, the second point that, that you make uh, about the, the exclusion of the indigenous voice or the indigenous people, is an interesting one, right? I mean, I, I'm not, I don't have an answer to it. Uh, all, all I'll say is that um, I'm, I'm very concerned by, by it uh, to the extent that um, in, this, in this manuscript that I'm working on, um, 
I have an entire chapter dedicated to to contemporary indigenous philosophy um, because I, in reading contemporary indigenous philosophies, uh, you you see a lot of echoes of what was going on in the 1940s in Mexico. This idea that uh, contemporary indigenous identity in Mexico, for example, is uh, is also likewise conceives itself as accidental as. Uh, as Nepantla, uh, Sosobra, and all these other ways. So I don't, I don't have an answer to to your question. I think that that's a very good one. Um, that that we that work in this field should be very aware of going forward. Um, and uh, and 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 so then finally at, about the uh, the the existentialist, uh, the feminist existentialist a bit that I didn't talk about. Um, one of the things, of course, that that we have been, uh, uh, and Robert is is down here in the in the audience too, that, that we've been uh, con concerned about is uh, the inclusion of uh, the feminist uh, voice in our accounts of Mexican philosophical history in the 20th century, for example. Um, and it's uh, it's been um, it's been quite a journey, simply because uh, the female voice. Uh, was kind of marginalized quite a bit in, in, in during this time in Mexico as well as everywhere else. But as uh, as as you've uh, also pointed out, Manuel, uh, Rosario Castellanos is a good point of departure for us, right? Uh, she presents in her work a picture of uh, that that resembles that of Luis Villoro and Uranga in this um, in in what. Uh, and in, in, in that it pushes back against this idea that there's this abstract universality that we should all be kind of bowing to. Um, so in the, in the stuff that I didn't talk about today, I talk about the, the, the uh, Rosario Castellanos uh, and her work in several places where she's uh, talking about how uh, the struggle for Mexican women is to be, the struggle for Mexican women uh, arises when they recognize that they're both Mexican and Mexican women. Uh, there's like a triple uh, marginalization that's going on, going on there, um, and and she makes some, she makes certain calls uh, to to other women in Mexico of things that they should be doing, right? And one of the things that she wants women to do is to write. In writing, you express you 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 manifest this transcendence that goes beyond your particular condition, and you can. Um, liberate yourself in a certain way, right? Uh, and so um, I try to, in, in, that, in that section, I try to connect her concerns and her um, prescriptions with the other things that I'm doing in the rest of the, of the paper with Uranga and Bioro. And this might be a, a bit of revisionist uh, history that I'm doing, um, but I think it's, <laughs> it's necessary to move the conversation forward, right? To, to say, okay, well, it's not just um, it's not it wasn't it wasn't just Mexican men that were kind of worried about these existential issues, uh, but there was also worries by Mexican women uh, that were uh, equally, if not even more, complicated because of their um, more complex nepantla, but their more complex marginalization and periphery and the, and, and peripheralization. Uh, so, so I, I don't know. Uh, your your questions always stump me, Manuel. Uh, so happy birthday and thanks for uh, thanks for asking them. Thank you very much. All right, Monica, please. Thanks, Carlos. Very fascinating. Um, um, I'd like to hear more about that substance because I don't think I'm um, clear about the work it does. In, in what you discussed. On one hand, I thought the emancipatory potential of existentialism was that it's coming up from substance metaphysics. Um, so then I didn't understand that bit, that uh, lack of, because it seems that the point is, if death is a part of being and you don't romanticize it at all, then I would think that, you know, a pure kind of uh, substance metaphysics, you move away from it at all. So it is, there is no need to set up a relation to that anymore. So then all of a sudden I didn't understand why one needs to go back to it. Hmm. 
Yeah. Well, um, the, 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 the whole bit about substance, I think is, uh, <clears throat> it's, and, and, I, and I try to kind of uh, re reduce it a little bit in the, in the, in the paper to, to make it sound as though it's a relational term, right? Uh, when 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 uh, when uh, Uranga is talking about its efficiency, I'm saying that it's it's, a, it's it, he's talking about this relationship that we what that one has. Now um, the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm trying to uh, avoid you know the the, the problems that you that you're talking about here, avoid that conversation. Right? Um, but but in 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 reality, what uh, what Uranga is referring to uh, when he's talking about substance. Uh, I think is this idea that when when Mexicans from their colonized uh, or post-colonial perspective uh, look out into the world, um, they are confronted by these notions of what humanity is. Right? Um, now, the picture of humanity that was handed to them in the colonial experience was the picture of the Spaniards as representing, uh, you know, a, a complete or um, fulfill substantial picture of what a human being is supposed to be. Um, on the other hand, the romanticization of the, the pre-colonial uh, indigenous past gives them also this idea that um, there's in, even within their history there is a a picture of the human which is complete and substantial um and the mexican as a hybrid of these two cultures of these two pictures of substantial humanity can't measure up to either right? uh and so in uranga's uh narrative i think uh what what substance means is just this idea of perfection, this idea of completion, this idea that um, uh, that there's these two uh, different, differing conceptions of the human, which are <laughs> not lacking in anything. Right? Uh, they have their history, they have their their ways, they have their culture, and they have everything. Uh, While well, the Mexican is trying desperately to um, to fit this middle ground. And so they're looking outward to these, to, to these two opposing worldviews and see them, and they see them as substantial, as completed pictures. Um, at least that's how I understand it. And so I, I, I think that um, the reason why I say that it's a relational, that insufficiency is a relational term is for that, for that reason, that I think that it's just the reason why Uranga just the top brings up substance is not to get in, in, involved in this uh, in this whole metaphysical story, but only to say uh, this is this is how our relationship is to these two worlds, right? Uh, it's it's one of where we feel in this relationship we feel insufficient. I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know if I'm answering any questions today, but <laughs> yeah, just feel free to let me know if you um, if you feel that you need to follow up on the question I ask. Um, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, now, Sean, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Sanchez, for an absolutely fascinating and, and rich talk and, and so much to think about, think with, um, and, and it certainly supports us in the kinds of things we're trying to do here at um, SOAS. The one thing that struck me as you were talking, and I, you know, I understand that what you're dealing with with Uranga is a particular historical moment, where existentialism is the kind of um, regnant philosophical um, discourse. But so many of the kind of concepts that existentialism seems to come up with, you know, um, insufficiency, Nepantla, etc., um, strike me as so much more, in and also is kind of lack of substance, it's kind of intermediary identity, this this kind of way of being in the world that is torn um, seems to me to be so much more in conversation with, or at least fruit, perhaps could fruitfully be in conversation with the more kind of post-structural take, which is so deeply critical 
of um, the existentialism of Sartre, et cetera, um, in France, as well as the kind of phenomenological um, stuff that comes out of Heidegger and then um, also Merleau-Ponty. Um, why, why isn't that, conf I mean, is that conversation happening? Um, is there a dialogue to be had with that? Or is there kind of investment in, in the existentialist project that is particular to the Mexican case? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, in, no, I don't think that there's any investment in keeping uh, the narrative as it's, uh, as, I've, as I've presented it here, right? The, the re, I, I see, like I've, I've noticed uh, also like this, that we can ex export uh, the Uranga critique or the Uranga description uh, and, and, and really kind of have put it in conversation with post-structuralists and other traditions um, very, very easily actually. Uh, and it would be fruitful to do that. Uh, the reason why I invest myself in this idea is because I'm, um, I can't seem to get myself to pull it out, to pull out the conversation out of this, of its historical milieu, right? of its, uh, of its, of, of where it was and what it was doing at that time. Yeah. Um, when when I first started this work back in two thousand and seven or so, um, I went to Mexico City because I wanted to know more about this tradition. I wanted to and get more text, there wasn't anything here. So I was, you know, I was in the National Archives and the University Archives, I'm sorry, uh, digging up stuff. Um, and, uh, and I found uh, not articles at that time, I didn't find a lot of articles or books, uh, but I, I, I stumbled upon this uh, newspaper controversy uh, that was happening in Mexico City from like 1948 to about 1951 where almost every Sunday uh, there was a debate between existentialists like Uranga and Zea and all these other guys um, about what existentialism was, about what it meant, about how to understand it, about what it didn't mean, about how much of how, how uh, the, uh, the, this other, this very famous uh, important Mexican philosopher Jose Vasconcelos um, who called it garbage, right? Existentialism is garbage and Sartre is a clown, so, <laughs> right? Uh, he was very, uh, this, uh, very upset with, with existentialism. So in, during this, this time in Mexico City newspapers and then on the Sundays and, the, and a lot of dailies, you had this, this concern with existentialism. Either it's garbage and we should absolutely forget it or it's amazing and we should use it to talk about a reality or, or you know, let's think of something else that's talking to talk about Marxism or whatever, but th there's this conversation and then there's worry, there's concern. Um, and so I find myself, uh, uh, I, I find it difficult to extricate, extricate myself from that thought that it, it was an important um, moment and I need to keep faithful to it, right? Uh, to, to, to that conversation. Um, now, um, Manuel, uh, who's here, Manuel Vargas, uh, uh, recently published a paper on accidentality that begins uh, in, in, his, in the spirit of Mexican philosophy and Emilio Uranga's uh, depiction of it for, you know, specifically. Uh, but he moves it into a conversation with uh, contemporary philosophy, which is insanely fruitful. It's very, very fruitful. And I think that that's, that's the direction that we are going I think that the direction that Mexican philosophy is heading is towards a, a less historical, more conceptual conversation. And, uh, and that's, in a way, my, this paper here today and the, and, the, and the manuscript that I'm writing is meant to make that move uh, as well. Like, I want to talk about these concepts that we could talk, that, that we could use um, in contemporary philosophy uh, with in conversation with deconstructionist and post-structuralist and Marxist and so on and so forth, uh, analytic philosophy, right? Uh, now, as I was uh, getting towards the end of my manuscript, I realized that uh, that we can talk about that, that existentialism, if, if you look at a syllabus on existentialism in, in the United States, for example, you will not find any 
everybody else but Camus and the French and the German. So then that got me worried and I decided to write this paper. <laughs> so so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's my attempt to say, okay, well, now you don't have an excuse, right? If you want to teach existentialism uh, globally, you have to include the, these people because I'm calling it something yeah. something catchy, right? <laughs> um, but but in, in reality, uh, I really, I, I think that uh, your, your point is a, it's a very good point. I think that uh, that is the future of, of Mexican philosophy to put it in conversation with, uh, with contemporary issues and concerns and philosophy as Manuel has done. And, um, and for me, the only reason why I'm kind of stuck in, 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 in talking about it in the way that I do is because I feel like it's important at least to record it for now. You know, and, may and I, may I just there. come back on that? I mean, I think you're completely right. I think philosophers are just very generally not very good at doing the, the historical work, right? Of kind of plotting why ideas emerge in the in the time and the space that they do. And I think in any kind of decol decolonized philosophy, that history is absolutely vital. We have to do that work of showing where, why, who is doing this work, why they're engaging with particular ideas, why they're discarding others, what they're innovating. Um, and, and, you know, I, I kind of think that what you've laid out today in this kind of genealogy, for want of a better word, of kind of how these ideas emerge and, and what they're intended to map is very important in sort of saying, we have something to say about all of this. We don't have to be in abeyance to, you know, deconstruction or post-structuralism or, or anything like that. You know, we're thinking, uh, it's, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, Paula Moya's work who says, you know, we speak from where we are, where we are, right? And I, I think that that's, that's really valuable about what you're doing in mapping that history. So I don't want to kind of question that project at all. I think that's, that's completely vital and it is a way of actually reinforcing that mexicanness to what you're doing this very specific conceptual that conceptual apparatus that has been you know brought out of this this work so you know just really thank you very much i appreciated it a lot thank you thank you all right elvis yeah thank you so much carlos um yeah, I just wanted to ask um, if I do understand these concepts um, quite well. It's, of course, it's something I'm really interested in exploring a bit more. Um, would, I, would I be right in saying that Zozobra, sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right, mm -hmm. um, that Zozobra, it's um, quite similar. Of course, it, I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but quite similar to the um, Africana or Black philosophical concept of double consciousness of uh, Du Bois, um, where, where, where we find ourselves in, in this fullness, um, where we are torn apart between two identities, two realities, and yeah. Um, and while Nep um, sorry, yeah, Nepatla, yeah, is um, the optimism of Zozo Brown. So it's, it's the in-between that gives us that potentiality, that possibility to go beyond this being torn apart and to realize that we can't actually uh, become anything. Uh, so would I be right to summarize uh, Zozo Bra as the uh, fullness and the partner as the possibility um, in terms of this in-betweenness? Um, the second thing I would like to have a bit more clarification about is um, uh, death as historical. Is this death as historical, which I find a very interesting concept? Uh, can it be experienced collectively? Um, so could it be um, collective death as historical? And, I, and I'm thinking about it this way, particularly because um, the concrete experiences, for example, in, in Mexico, um, in Mexican philosophy was collective as well, not just individualistic. Um, so yeah, um, I, may, I may just be babbling, but uh, I hope you understand the, uh, the questions I'm trying to ask. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, th th thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that the way that you describe Sosobra and Epantla is, is, is fair. Um, it's, um, 
when when Uranga when Uranga, for example, uh, brings up those two concepts in uh, in his book, um, you, you'll find uh, as you're reading it, you'll find that uh, it's very hard to pry them apart. Right? It's very hard to say that the sobra is one thing and a pantla is another. Um, I've been just obsessed about the fact that they're they they must be pryable. They are two different things. Uh, and so I just been making this, I just been kind of going over and over and over uh, about it uh, by saying that, yes, uh, so sobra <clears throat> is like the, so sobra is the expression of Nepantla in the sense that as you're right, Nepantla uh, is this, uh, is this in between us that, um, that represents the possibilities of movement of doing. Uh, when, when I think of, Nepa, of being in between uh, in here uh, in the United States, the, the Chicana feminists uh, appropriated this concept uh, a few decades ago to talk about um, their in-betweenness uh, as this point of revolutionary praxis, right? This idea that uh, from, from this not being tied down to any particular identity, they will be able to, uh, to emerge and fight off oppressions of sorts. Um, so yeah, so, so Nepantla belongs in that, in that space of possibility. Uh, so Sobra um, is this, in existentialism, uh, the, 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 the clearest comparison to so Sobra is anxiety or angst in European existentialism. Um, however, uh, I find that so Sobra is much more complex than, than simply uh, anxiety or angst, right? It is, uh, as you say, uh, if we prob problematize uh, double consciousness and um, and make it even more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, if if it's if if we make it even uh, a, a, a more urgent kind of thing, uh, then then yeah, I think that's a sober and double consciousness are are similar in that way, in the sense that in, in Sosobra, you find yourself always uh, uh, being pulled in different directions by uh, different demands, uh, either existential demands or just you know, material demands or whatever. You're all, you never feel like, like you can be settled in into your in-between it. Right, um, you, you can, there, there's a sense in which the in between us is this liberating kind of spot that you can settle into, but so Sobra pulls you, right? It's pulling you in different directions. Um, and there's no, uh, there's no peace. Right? There's no peace to that. It's a constant uh, being pulled in all different, different directions. That's why this, the image of being quartered kind of came to me. Like uh, I, you know, I, I, I wanted to come up with, with an, an idea of it. And I thought, yeah, well, you know, in, in medieval times when people got, got split in fours by horses, that's the, that's the idea I think that, the, that this concept is trying to convey. Uh, my, my colleague, Francisco Gallegos, who has his hand raised uh, and I, uh, we published a paper, uh, not a paper, but a, a, an opinion piece right after the elections uh, in the US a couple of years ago. Uh, where we talked about so sobra as, as as being this defining as as that moment kind of exemplifying uh, so sobra for everyone, you know, and uh, and I think it really hit a nerve because we we eventually uh, started the the paper was I mean the article was uh, circulated all over the planet pretty much and you know a lot of people related to this idea finding themselves torn apart by different demands and different different things. So so yeah, I, I think I think you're right in thinking about it that way. Yeah. Um, oh and, and then about about death. Um, um, the, the, the notion of death um, that that Uranga uh, kind of proposes here um, the way that I understand it is this idea that um, death is the death the, the the coexistence with death has been one where 
Mexicans have existed with, with death since the conquest. Right? Um, there's an excellent book by, uh, I forgot his name, but it's, the book is called The Mestizo Mind. Uh, and in this book, um, this, uh, the author uh, had, it takes excer excerpts out of uh, witness testimonies from the days of the conquest of Mexico City and talks about how in those days after the conquest of Mexico City in 1521, bodies littered the streets and the canals of, of, the, of the city and remained there rotting for months. Right? Um, and to walk from one place to another was to smell death, to be with death always. Um, and that memory, uh, I think, uh, stayed with it generationally with, with Mexicans to the point that death is something that just is just there, right? Um, and and I and and I believe that it helps explain a lot of things, right? Um, it, it helps explain a lot of attitudes that I may get in trouble for for promoting here, but um, I, I recently published a book. Uh, Elvis mentioned it. It's called the. Uh, a sense of brutality philosophy after narco culture, where I talk about um, the violence and brutality of contemporary uh, Mexican uh, narco culture. The fact that Mexico suffers, really suffers. And, and today in the United States, we're suffering because the cartels are, are, are putting a squeeze on our avocado, per, uh, avocado consumption uh, and our lime consumption. And, uh, and they're killing people for avocados and limes in Mexico right now. Uh, and the cart so the cartel, the, the narco state in Mexico is, is very serious and the violence that they carry out is brutal, right? Uh, and, and one of the claims that I make in the book is that um, it, it seems as though uh, Mexicans live with death in a very ordinary way, right? Um, based on even current testimony. Uh, there's, you know, there's a dead guy. Okay, well, let's go to the store now, right? Kind of thing. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the, there's a problem with thinking of death in this way, though, right? Uh, it, and, and the problem is that uh, you begin to, uh, at least from a Western perspective, think of these uh, of these people as barbarian in some sense. Like, oh my God, you know, they're they look at the way they're living with the dead. Look at the way they're they they think of death or 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 the way they value life, right? They don't value life very much. Um, so, so there's there, there's some things that we, we must talk about when we talk about death in this way. But uh, I think that Uranga wanted to back back in and when he was writing, he wanted to talk about that relationship that Mexicans have always had with death. This idea of death as being an accepted fact and not something that you look forward to, but something that you kind of live with, right? Um, and and I'll say one final thing. I mean, and this is just trivial, but growing up and when I grew up in, in Michoacan in Mexico and uh, and talk of spirits, talk of ghosts uh, is, is very is very common, very familiar. Uh, yeah, you 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 are frightened by the possibility that if you walk out of your room, you're gonna encounter this whole you know this this crew of ghosts and spirits hanging out in the in the in the front yard. But um, when people talk about it, you don't question their sanity. Right? You, you don't, if, if somebody says, oh yeah, I saw a ghost last night, you don't, you don't immediately think, oh, well, you need medicine. You, you're like, oh, who was it, <laughs> right? It's like, uh, you, you just assume that they're, that they're right in, in their experience. Uh, and I think that, that speaks to that, uh, to, to that idea. So, so yeah, so I, I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop talking about that now, but um, yeah. all right. All right, thank you very much. We got one final question from Francesco. Thank you so much. Uh, really lovely talk. And I'm so taken by this project of trying to carve out existentialism and distinguish it from French existentialism. Um, and so I've been thinking about trying to track the contrasts that you've you, you didn't frame it this way as like explicitly, I want to just compare and contrast, but I've been doing it sort of as you've been talking and I've been trying to like track it. And so tell me, tell me if, if I got anything wrong, I'm going to, I'm going to post something here in the chat uh, just so I can 
it's a lot, it's a lot of ideas, so it keeps things easier. So um, the French German existentialist tradition, they talk about angst and anxiety, but uh, in the Mexican existentialist tradition, we talk about Zosovra. So, I mean, that's an interesting question. Like, what is the difference there? Uh, one thing you talked about is stuckness versus Zosovra is about as a movement, as a kind of you never can find your balance, is a teeter tottering. Uh, then you have death as as a telos versus Mexican death as an everyday companion. I thought that was really nicely nicely put. One thing you didn't really talk about, but I thought maybe you touched on is like this idea from the French and existential and German existentialist tradition is about uh, individuating yourself from das man, about conformism and just being a, be an authentic individual versus something about how in the existentialist tradition it's not so much about individualism but about being authentic as mexicans it's about asserting um, a mexican uh, self-determination and, and a celebration of mexican style as as authentic and something we're doing collectively is the the existentialists seem to be doing a collective project and that seems to be an important sort of collectivism ethos there um, uh, and then, you know, in terms of the idea that like the Europeans are substantial, but we Mexicans are accidental, that gets into trouble, like in the ways that Manuel pointed out. But it, but it does seem like there's something to the idea that um, uh, as ideals, as ideals of responsibility, like that there are some people who think that what it is to be responsible, to take responsibility for your life, is to kind of get your shit together to to like decide what really matters what's your priority and don't be so dispersed don't be kind of like uh just kind of putting out fires but kind of get yourself together um as like a committed individual who kind of knows what matters and what doesn't versus a kind of uh, a kind of responsibility that's about sort of responding to the to the contingencies of life, knowing that that might mean that you don't, that you can't offer a substantial explanation for who you are and why why you are the way you are, that it's okay that you're dispersed and conflicted and you don't make sense entirely. There's not a smooth narrative um, that you can reflectively endorse or rationally endorse. Um, so that that is that is responsibility. It's responding to contingent circumstances. That's a, I think that would be an interesting kind of way of teasing that out. And then one thing you didn't mention at all, which is a big theme in French and ex German existentialism is absurdity, the idea that life is absurd um, from Camus. And I was, you know, you kind of, I mean, there's like obvious overlaps and similarities, but like one thing about this idea that life has no rational justification, anything can happen at any time, you know, uh, that comes out of uh, Camus um, uh, is um, that kind of obscures some basic geopolitical analysis of like why some people's lives are so absurd as opposed to other people's. In other words, it, it obscures basic analysis of oppression of oppressed communities. Like some people's lives are more absurd than others because they don't have power, because they're not calling the shots, because they're constantly having to figure out a way of making their marginalized existence livable. Um, and it seems like the Mexican existentialists are really trying to put a, a political analysis of geopolitical oppression and power relations at the center of all of these discussions in a way that the French and German existentialists just didn't at all. So I'm curious, what do you think about that? Um, and any, any sort of thoughts or responses that come, come to you from, from those provocations? Um. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Francisco, like always. Um, well, um, the, the stuff about individualist authenticity uh, versus collective authenticity, I think that it's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's an interesting one, right? And it's an interesting uh, move there that I, I'm, I'm currently uh, trying to tease out. Um, there is a sense in, in with Portilla, for example, uh, with Lopoldo Zea, with Emilio Ranca and Luis Villoro, that the ultimate goal, the ultimate uh, prize here is to arrive at, a, at an existentialism that values a collective authenticity over, in, over subjective or individualistic authenticity. 
um, that that true value comes from community. True value comes from commitment to that community. Um, now, it's 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 a very um, it's a struggle for them to make this claim, uh, <clears throat> and 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 you see you see, you see the contrast, or you see really like the, what the struggle is when when you contrast this uh, collective authenticity with indigenous uh, conceptions of community. Um, the indigenous conception of community, and I talk about this in the manuscript, uh, is one where um, the individual it does not fit at all, right? There's no fit whatsoever for individual authenticity uh, in any sense. The, 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 in, the indigenous con conception of community is one where the community is all there is. And if you're not part of the community, you're nothing, right? There's nothing for you. Um, now, as I contrast uh, the, the, the conceptions of community by say Jorge Portilla uh, and, and, and those uh, indigenous uh, conceptions, both of them are trying to arrive at this conception of collective authenticity that, uh, that, that, that's different in a way because within the, within the existentialist uh, project, uh, it's important that you have some sort of autonomy it's important that you make the decision to put your community first, for example. And in doing that, in making that decision, that free decision, um, you are somehow becoming authentic in a way. Um, and so, but, but it, so it retains, right? It retains that individualism in a certain sense. Um, and, and so that's, that's the struggle there that, that, I'm, that I'm trying to tease out still. And it, and it and it was it came to the forefront because I was thinking about indigenous notions of community. Uh, so so that so that's that's one thing. Uh, it, I'm still kind of working on that, but it, but it's an interesting and very good question. Uh, that that um, could take up an entire class period, right? <laughs> so so you know just to, to to plug the whole purpose of this project is yeah we want to talk about this in the classroom. So you know you can spend an entire class period talking about that. Uh, and then the, the last thing I I'll, I'll mention is this notion of absurdity that, that you talk about. Um, uh, <clears throat> now, Carlos Pereda, who um, uh, you, might, you, you might know Francisco, uh, but Carlos Pereda is this uh, Uruguayan Mexican philosopher in Mexico City, who has been uh, a proponent of Mexican philosophy for many years. He's, he's still around. and. He's been a proponent by pushing back against us, right? Like he, he, he's like, well, what makes it Mexican? Why is there a Mexican in front of philosophy? What's the point, right? But he's been a very motivating factor for us because he, uh, he pushes us to kind of move forward. But anyways, he, he, he's something of an analytic philosopher and he has this concept he calls arrogant reason. Uh, and the concept of arrogant reason is this idea that uh, it's is basically the idea that the West has imposed upon it, the colonies uh, this idea of, of reason as being the end all be all of all things, right? Um, and what Western concepts are supposed to uh, give us a truth of things in a very straightforward way. He says, that's arrogant. That just, that, that's an arrogance. That's a colonial prejudice, a colonial vice. Um, now, when, well, one of the things that I'm doing is that I, I'm, I'm keeping in mind that idea of, of arrogant reason as I move along my readings of these philosophers, um, because I want to make sure that um, that I that I'm reading them correctly. I think Carlos Pereira is right. right? I think that uh, that that one of the things that Mexican existentialists existentialists have done is combat the pretensions of arrogant reason by saying, well. We have our Mexican uh, sort of reasoning going on here that explains death and community and freedom and um, being in between and being anxious. Uh, and you have yours and ours is not arrogant because it is grounded firmly in our experience. Uh, yours is arrogant because it's trying to explain our experience. Right? Um, and so I, I like this idea that, that, that you're mentioning about absurdity, right? It's, uh, I don't. Th I, I don't think that Mexicans, um, and it's a, and I. I really haven't thought about this, Francisco. I, I never thought about the, the the lack of the discussion of absurdity in 
in Mexican existentialism. I really hadn't thought about that until right now. Uh, noticed it even that, okay, wait a minute, why are you talking about absurdity? Well, because they don't have to. At, at a certain point, um, the idea is that colonial reason is absurd reason. Right? And, and so we're not going to even talk about it. We're just going to say like Uranga says, uh, any conception of the human that sees it as substantial is arrogant. Um, and so, and so, I really like that. I think that that I'm going to keep that in mind as I go as I move forward. But um, you know, that's that's pretty much all I all I have for you. But you know, as, as always, we'll keep talking about things. All right. Thank you very much for that extensive uh, explanations on all these questions raised. In the very last question, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to hand it over for Elvis. Uh, to uh, finalize our session today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Bian. And thank you so much, uh, Carlos. Um, I think we've had a very interesting um, lecture as well as uh, a discussion session today. Um, very interesting um, thoughts and concepts to keep in mind going forward. And we really look forward to your um, forthcoming book, uh, hopefully sometime soon uh, we'll have it uh, to, to add to our uh, literature um, as we get familiarized with all the uh, philosophical traditions. Um, so we'll be meeting again in April, in the last Friday of April, April 29th. And um, I, I, I know that we'll be looking at Chinese philosophy, but I'm not sure which aspect of it <laughs> because that's another very broad um, and comprehensive tradition. Uh, but till then, um, thank you all for uh, being with us today. We hope you have um, a fantastic weekend ahead after the week's walk as usual. And um, we look forward to being in touch, uh, Carlos, um, in the future. Uh, do take care, everyone. And, uh, yeah, uh, let me just yeah. add, you know, please do join us in our monthly seminars. I think, you know, we need to build a critical mass to make sure that you know, philosophy is no longer the purview of dead white <laughs> middle-class men. And um, it would be just great if you could all join. But for now, I would just like to say, viva existentialism. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I want to thank everybody too for, uh, for, for coming and for listening to me ramble on. And that was great. Really, really great. Thank you so much. This will all be put up on YouTube as, as are all of our seminars. Um, so if you join the mailing list, we can make sure you have links to all of the previous talks as well as this one. But thanks so much for coming. It was lovely to see you all here. And Elvis, thank you so much for organizing this fantastic talk and Bjorn for helping curate the, the discussion. So have a lovely weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.